Greetings all! Quick one this time, prompted by an image which came across my desk this week. I've seen it before, but now I've actually got a little bit of time to attack it. You may be familiar with the Tucker Tiger. If not, after this video, you will be. It even shows up at the beginning of the movie about Preston Tucker, which I thought was actually a pretty good movie. Uh, but anyway, the gist of it is that Tucker had built an armoured car that the army rejected on the grounds of being too fast. The grounds for this seems to be a promotional movie put out by the Tucker Company. It's exactly what they say. However, it had one drawback. It was too fast. A hundred miles an hour, the fastest combat car ever built. At that time, it was the opinion that a combat car shouldn't be driven over 35 miles an hour, so the government wasn't interested in contracting for any at that time. Which seems to be a bit of an odd argument. It reminds me somewhat of the argument that the US Army didn't want to use Christie tanks because it showed up the Army's own designs. Well, I will direct you to my video on the Christie tanks to put that one to bed. So I decided to do a little bit of hunting. Never anything better than looking up the original documentation, after all, especially with these things that come across your Facebook feed or whatever. Well, it turned out that the reason that the Tucker Tiger was not accepted for service was, and the War Wheels website actually has this correct, that it was just not a good military vehicle. It did some things very well indeed, and it garnered much praise. But there were also certain expectations of military vehicles which the car failed to meet. Tucker demonstrated the vehicle in Washington DC in October 1938, and it caught the attention of a Gladion Barnes, at that stage still but a lieutenant colonel. Two days later he sent a letter to the lads at Aberdeen, warning them that the Tucker Tiger was going to be sent up that way, and to run it through a quick, inexpensive test. He instructed them to limit the top speed tested to about 60 miles an hour, as the higher speed had no military significance, and the risk of operating such a short wheelbase vehicle at very high speeds wasn't warranted. To a point, this is the source of the myth, that it was rejected for its high speed, insofar as that goes. The final report also stated that the excessive speeds are of no military value in accompanying combat trains. Basically, if the car is on its own, that's one thing, but usually they have to be part of a unit which provides supply and logistics, and that can only go so fast. Now, in fairness, around this time the Army was learning in exercises the value of independent armored car detachments for rapid movements, but maybe that hadn't filtered down to Aberdeen yet. Either way, the high speed was not held against the vehicle. The Army just didn't see the point in it and didn't give any bonus credit. Anyway, the vehicle arrived in Aberdeen on the 21st of November for an abbreviated 8-day test program. The description of the vehicle was as follows. This vehicle is a completely enclosed car, a 4x2 unit being manned by a crew of 3. It is powered by a 12-cylinder Packard engine developing 175 horsepower at an engine speed of 3450 revolutions per minute. The armament of the vehicle consists of one 37mm automatic weapon, capable of being traversed through 360 degrees, one caliber 50 machine gun, and two caliber 30 machine guns. It turned out that the 37mm automatic weapon in question was made by American Armaments Corporation. The ammunition came in five round clips. We have encountered this weapon before, actually, in Marmon Harrington tanks, and I will direct you to that video. Anyway. Back to the text. The machine guns are mounted for frontal and side angle fire. The armor of the vehicle is, in general, of 9 sixteenths of an inch thickness and both of welded and bolted construction. The sloping sides of the body lessen the probability of bullets striking normal to its surface. The armor is not used for structural purpose, the frame being maintained in the design. Clear fields of vision are provided by the six large windows containing a bulletproof glass mounted in rubber. The vehicle can be converted into a track laying vehicle. The track was not available at the time of the test, consequently the test was only conducted for a wheeled vehicle. It is understood that the tracks are of rubber and fabric, of a V-belt type guided by grooves cut in the tires. Steering is limited by the elasticity of the track. 
The entire interior of the body is lined with sponge rubber. This provides protection to members of the crew against excessive jolting. Thus ends the description. There was one addition discovered. When they were measuring the centre of gravity, which was 32 and one half inches above the ground, if you're curious, the gun turret was not armoured. The bulletproof glass in the body was very, very good, two and three quarter inches thick and well remarked upon, stopping even a calibre 50 round, although it did permit some spalling. A calibre 30 didn't have any negative effects on the armour, but the big glass turret for the 37, that was a different matter. The whole vehicle came in at 10,750 pounds. So, the good points. The vehicle was amply powered, though the testers didn't go past 75 miles an hour, it was obvious that it did have more in it. Handling was considered excellent and the ride fantastic. The report said it had probably better riding qualities than any vehicle ever tested at Aberdeen. The front springs were coil, the rear leaf, but the report called out two unique features, a lateral sway bar and a segmented leaf in the spring. So good was the suspension that it set a new standard for testing of wheeled vehicles over obstacles. No vehicles had been tried over some of them for ridograph testing to have records to compare against. 0 to 60 was somewhere over 35 seconds. The turning circle was considered quite small. The gun was fired by AAC personnel, not Aberdeen folks like last time, and didn't cause over two inches of sway when it fired to the side. However, whatever about the ride quality, it was still nowhere near stable enough to have the vehicle fire accurately on the move. And this applied both to the 37 and the machine guns. There are no particular remarks on any failures of the weapon. The turret also messed up the otherwise very low silhouette of the vehicle. Now, in fairness, there was a later open turret designed, which is far less prominent, uh, but that would be in the future. The engine was very quiet, and the vehicle could be a good scout, subject to the height. Finally, comfort and safety of the crew. Comfortable seats, together with the ride qualities, would result in the crew arriving to the fight fresh. The interior of the car had well-rounded corners wherever possible and was padded throughout to reduce the effects of sharp objects interacting with the crew. Excellent vision provided by the glass. In general, it can be said that the comfort and safety to the crew are excellent. So that's the good news, which is actually pretty good. No mention was made, positive or negative, of the swiveling headlights. I suspect it wasn't considered actually a very useful feature. There are some tests though, which you will note I have not mentioned yet. The Toker performed fantastically on roads, but wars don't only happen on roads. In fact, there is likely to be quite a bit of off-road driving involved. And this is a rear-wheel drive 5-ton car. Off it went to the standard sand course first. The first try, it bogged down. They dragged the car out, and this time they took a running start at it, and the vehicle made it out the far end of the sand pit. However, the course in the sand pit was supposed to have curves. The report stated, it was obvious that the unit could not negotiate turns in the sand within the course. And it is considered that the vehicle failed to pass the prescribed test for operation in sand. The next thing on the list is to try the mud course. They took a look at the car. They took a look at the mud. They took a look at the car again and said, nope, not even going to try. Why get muddy with the inevitable recovery? Similarly, they decided not to try the steeper slopes, partially because it was only two wheel drive and partially because they didn't think the brakes were strong enough. Similarly, they didn't do a side slope test. Compared to other vehicles at Aberdeen, the center of gravity was a little bit on the higher side, whilst the vehicle tread was noticeably narrower. One can imagine how that would end up. On the plus side, the report did note how easy it would be to escape from the vehicle if it overturned. By the time they were done, it was time for the car to go home. The car could do most anything except drive off-road. That one thing was considered something of a deal-breaker for the army. You can kind of understand why. However, 
Tucker did advertise the car as available with all-wheel drive. The report's recommendation was that if they could at least get the car as capable as the M3 Scout car, then they ought to have another look at it. It seems that they never did, and so the Tucker car never went anywhere. Now the other thing one will hear is that the turret was adopted by the Army Air Force and the US Navy, but is for some reason not credited. This gun turret, however, was one of Tucker's wartime inventions that was used to very good advantage during the war. United States bombers, PT boats, and other war vehicles were equipped with this gun turret. Well, the Air Force has something to say on that. They have a document entitled Development of Anti-Aircraft Gun Turrets in the Army Air Forces 1917-1944, written in 1947 but now publicly available. It has three pages on Tucker, out of 300 or so. Basically, the Air Forces, oh, oh, okay, back then the Army Air Corps, were indeed introduced to the Tucker turret when they went to the Tucker factory to check out the cannon mount on the armored car. It had two features of particular note. A commutator, which did not arc under rapid reversals, and glass impregnated coils as burnout deterrents. However, the performance of the turret itself was considered definitely unsatisfactory for aircraft use. The overall document, you know, 300 pages, places everything in context. The British had figured out aircraft turrets already, but for whatever reason, the various American turret companies decided they had to go learn their own lessons. The British were using hydraulics, not electrics, and eventually some American manufacturers copped onto this, including Tucker. Eventually, he created a twin caliber 50 turret for the B-17, except using hydraulics for better performance. The armament laboratory took a look at this and deemed it unsatisfactory and rejected the design. Other companies either went with hydraulics or figured out amplidine systems. It turned out that creating aircraft turrets was not easy, and to simplify the process, each aircraft project had a turret manufacturer assigned to design the turrets for each aircraft. So this was in some contrast to the British system where there was only two major and one minor turret manufacturer, and they built basically interchangeable turrets. Sperry was assigned the B-17, Bendix the B-25, Martin the B-26, and General Electric the A-20. Tucker was sort of penciled in for the Brewster X-3B-2A, eventually pulled out and got replaced by Maxon, uh, the same blokes who made the turret on the M-16 Quad 50 half-track, but that aircraft didn't really go anywhere. Also taking over some of the Tucker production was Emerson, who subcontracted for other manufacturers, particularly Sperry. And that's about all that the Air Forces have to say on the Tucker turret. There seems to be no indication of any of the American turrets being particularly influenced by the Tucker designs. Whether the Tucker turret had any influence in naval turret design, I have no idea. That's not an army thing, I haven't done the research, so go ask Drach. So there you go, the overview of just how good, or not, the Tucker Tiger was. Hope you find it interesting and informative. Take care.